uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm uh, especially excited to see so many students here uh, because I have the great privilege of introducing one of my teachers. So mm. this is kind of a fun true, true that moment. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to claim me that way, but I do, I do. <laughs> um, but we're just so happy to have all of you here. Uh, this is the second talk in our series on religion, law, and society, uh, which is co-organized by my colleagues Tom Cobb and Sarah Hampson. Um, my name is Eric Bugish, and I am a lecturer here in why well, do religious studies, but I'm in the division of politics, philosophy, and public affairs. Um, the series, as we sort of conceived of it, was to think about the interrelations and interconnections between religion and law, especially in light of current events, um, and particularly focusing on recent decisions that came this summer with respect to um, same-sex marriage and the sort of religious liberty claims opposing those, uh, most recently with uh, Kim Davis in Kentucky, uh, the clerk who, who felt burdened by having to recognize uh, same-sex marriage. Um, so that will be part of the theme tonight uh, in uh, Ludger's talk. Uh, and it was part of the theme in the talk we had in our first um, lecture by Stephen Green of Willamette uh, Law School. Yeah. <coughs> he was approaching the issue from the perspective of a lawyer and one who was instrumental actually in writing um, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, which Ludger will give us a bit of a philosophical critique of in part tonight. Mm. So there will be a nice conversation between those two lectures. Um, and we have the video of the first lecture. If you're interested in finding that, um, you can email me I'm here, uh, and we can, we can make it available to you. Um, also, I want to alert the students in the room to a special lunch seminar that uh, Professor Biff Hughes Bailey will be leading on his book, um, Between, Between a, a Man, man and, and a Woman? woman question mark. Uh, why conservatives oppose same-sex marriage. And if you would like to attend that seminar, uh, email me. That will be tomorrow at noon in West Coast Grocery, 322. Uh, free lunch. So there is, there is such a thing as a free lunch. Uh, and that will be tomorrow. So let me know if you'd like to join us. Um, so Professor Ludger Biffus bailey is the Distinguished Professor of Philosophy, Religion and culture, no, philosophy, gender and culture <laughs> yes. at Lemoyne College. So, perfectly interdisciplinary for our very interdisciplinary school of interdisciplinary arts and sciences. So, yeah. how many interdisciplinaries can you get in one sentence? <laughs> uh, Ludger is the author of two books uh, Beyond the Philosopher's Fear, which looks at the relationship between religion, gender, and skepticism in the American philosopher Stanley Cavell, and of the book I just mentioned, Between a Man and a Woman. Uh, why conservatives oppose same-sex marriage. Um, and I should say that this talk is brought to you by uh, the University of Washington Tacoma, obviously, you're here, uh, the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences, the Division of Politics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs, and the Law School of the University of Washington. So without further ado, Professor Biff Hughes bailey Hello, thank you. <clears throat> well, well, thank you, Eric. And thank you, the sponsors of this event. Um, it's a stra My name is Ludger Wiefus Bailey, strange German name, because I'm a strange German. Uh, do I project good enough, or shall I ramp it up? Uh, so I came to this country in 1996 to study with Hilary Putnam um, philosophy of religion. And I discovered this interesting thing, which nobody had ever talked about in Germany. And it was called feminism. And uh, I uh, was very interested to study the interrelationship between secular norms of citizenship and religious normativity in the American context. So the Between a Man and a Woman book is an outgrowth of that. And I actually try to present a reading of conservative Christian resistance to same-sex marriage that makes understandable what is at stake for conservative Christians there. So that is the venue that brings me into the discussion of religious liberties. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that I have to do the uh, McGonagall thing, so I can only read this clearly if I have my glasses on, and I can only see you if I look over my glasses. Uh, you know, I'm an, I'm an older man. 
So <clears throat> what I want to do today um, is I want to proceed in three steps. First, I will give you a brief history of religious liberty claims in the context of the civil rights era. And you have heard about that already, I assume, from in the previous talk. And I want to give a Kantian evaluation of that history to argue that what is at stake here are not just liberty claims in religion, but also claims to citizenship. So we negotiate through these liberty claims different stages of belonging in our body politics. So I will develop a three-partite framework of citizenship, active citizenship, passive citizenship, and the ungoverned and religious liberty claims help us to push people into passive citizenship or to make claims about active citizenship. And then I want to move to the Roberts Court, uh, the Supreme Court under our current um, Chief Justice, and the framework um, of religious liberty jurisprudence that, they, uh, that Robert Kortz uses, and I want to partic particularly look at causal entanglement. So if, you've, if you have a religious belief and you feel burdened by a specific law, what's the link, the causal link between the burden of the law and your own religious belief? Um, and the novelty of the Roberts Court is not only that corporations are persons, but also that if a petitioner claims to be burdened, then the court has to treat that claim to be burdened at face value. There's no other um, uh, rational test. So, and finally, I want to evaluate um, what this type of jurisprudence does for our contestations to citizenship and belonging um, for our democratic process. So what is the implied theology of this jurisprudence? So that's where we are going. Um, but before we go there, um, so I want to give you a little bit of a taste of what religious liberty claims are brought forward. And if you can, if you think you know whether this is a contemporary claim or a a claim from the civil rights era, try to make a note, right? Is it more today? Is it more about same-sex marriage? Or is it more about interracial marriage? So that's what I worry about. I worry about the wrath of God on our people. I'm scared to death. Sincere religious belief in the context of same-sex marriage or interracial marriage. Well, this one is a 2016 claim about same-sex marriage. A Georgia State representative and Baptist deacon who introduced a Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, bill focused on same-sex couples in 2016. Spurning and rejecting the plain truth of the word of God has always resulted in the judgment of God. Man, in overstepping the boundary lines God has drawn, has taken another step in the direction of inviting the judgment of Almighty God. That's a claim um, in the, from the context of interracial marriage. The Christian God's solution to human resistance to God's law is to totally destroy the people involved. This destruction is proof that divine law is enacted for the defense of society and civilization. Uh, this is ex uh, uh, an evangelical Christian explaining how sexual mingling of Jews has led to the Holocaust. So we see here a trajectory of religious li liberty claims um, from the civil rights era onward. Uh, and here is a cartoon. You see the Supreme Court um, justice uh, there foisting integration onto the southern church. And through that integration, bringing about the destruction of Christian America. So we have, you know, in these claims, a link between um, America's religious identity, belonging, and sincere religious claims, sincerely held religious beliefs. So now let me go to my real paper. Um, you know the case of Kim Davis, the Kentucky County clerk. You have talked about this. The Davis affair is interesting to me because it reopens the battle lines that are familiar in United States history. The conflict between states' rights and federal law, such that states refuse to acknowledge the legitimacy of federal intervention based on individual and collective claims to religious liberty. 
what makes Davis into a powerful symbol is that she is a specter of those earlier debates when southern states and their officials supported their resistance to federal civil rights legislation with claims to their Christian beliefs. During the upheavals of the civil rights movement, many local, state, and even federal officials based their objection to racial integration on a two-pronged argument, sincerely held individual beliefs and states' rights. Segregationist policies were defended with reference to biblical text and divine natural law. Examples abound, so I don't need to reiterate them here. But we see here a rhetorical nexus between race, sexuality, religion, and political apocalypse. And it's fully mobilized in 1954 when the Supreme Court ruled in Brown versus Board of Education that state laws creating separate schools for blacks and whites were unconstitutional. In response, hundreds of Virginians, for example, urged their governor to not comply with the court order since integration in schools would lead to interracial marriages that contravened divine word. Let me flag already here the tenuous causal nexus between the legislation's burden, integration in schools, and the religious belief in question, no interracial marriage. From this very short look back into the recent history of religious liberty claims in the United States, we see that such claims are entangled with concerns for the character and shape of the United States polity. Methodologically, what follows is that we need to analyze religious language in such a way that we can see the connection between religious liberty claims and other registers of language like citizenship or sexuality or race. To use a distinction from scholastic logic, these claims may be positively about sincerely held religious beliefs, but they're not exclusively so. Part of their religious nature is that they are also about godly government, exclusion of certain bodies from the body politic, and thus decisions over citizenship. This is part of their religious nature. It's not a secular add-on, but through the entanglement of religious and civic and sexual and gendered and racial claims, it is part of their entanglement that these claims are not just about what the Bible says. The language of restricting full citizenship rights to minoritized populations can find a systemic precedent in Kant's understanding of citizenship. Kant's framework can bring to the fore an understanding of citizenship as a continuum and thus as open for complex political contestation over the question of who owns a government and whose bodies matter to a government. This framework will help us understand the discursive context within which operates political discourse to, about sincerely held religious beliefs. Let me begin by noting that Kant indeed limits active citizenship. According to him, the right to govern the affairs of the states belongs only to men, to those who are deemed competent or to those who are not dependently employed, with the exception of civil servants such as university professors like Kant. In contrast, women, the incompetent or those who are dependent in employment are passive citizens. They are excluded from decision making and voting. Yet they enjoy freedom and equality derived from the fact that they are human beings who together constitute a people. Note this peculiar formulation, the slippage here between grounding freedom and equality in human and in civic terms. Thus, Kant's text seems unsure about whether to ground passive citizenship's right in human or in national qualities. What constitutes a people, however, is membership in the same republic, a membership that is tenuous for passive citizens. Passive citizens have a government of their own only in the sense that a government claims them as beneficiaries of governmental actions. However, it's not their own government, since owning a government requires deciding its course. In addition to this distinction between passive and active citizens, Kant text also introduces a third category of people. The humans who constitute a people can be seen as having been generated by their common mother, the republic, so that's a civic generation. 
Yet these Republicans should not mix with the savages who live next to them in lawlessness. We, the children of the Republic, see with deep contempt and as raw, beastly and degrading the political attachments of the, quote, savages, that is, of those humans who live outside of the structure of a lawful order. This invitation to contempt is surprising given that Kant claimed that it was a duty to refrain from contempt towards even the vicious person within the Republic. Apparently, in Kant's view, living outside of this political order corrodes one's humanity, whereas engaging in immoral actions does not. Given that Kant's work has a substantial amount of racial and racist prejudice, this hierarchization of human dignity and citizenship is not surprising. In the world of Kant's text, gendered and economic oppression reduces, therefore, some humans to the status of passive citizens with a tenuous hold onto the dignity status of compatriot. This point can remind us of an insight of feminist substantive uh, theories of autonomy. The ability to act autonomously can be degraded by oppressive social structures. Autonomy can exist and flourish only through the exercise of the capacity to make decisions and through cultural, social and economic mes messages that induce a person's trust in her judgment of values. Thus, passive citizens and passive citizenship reflects economic and gender structured that aim to actively inhibit the attainment of the dignity status of an active citizen. So by pushing people into passive citizenship, we degrade their ability to become fully autonomous people. While voting rights or marriage rights confer a status of full citizenship on some co-inhabitants co of the United States, a queer political intervention would wonder what other gendered and economic obstacles to active citizenship structure our society. For example, in Shelby County versus Alabama, uh, Shelby County, Alabama versus Holder, we see a re-entrenchment of state intervention that tries to limit voting rights for African Americans. By limiting their access to full active citizenship, the legislatures with court approval aim to force black bodies into passive membership. Kant's text can alert us to yet another register of oppression, attacking men and women who are slotted into the category of the ungoverned human. They are marked as extra-political bodies, degraded in their humanity and incapable of consideration as passive citizens because they are placed outside of a republic. Placed outside of the bounds of government, they are denied a government of their own and no government claims them fully as compatriots. The status allocation of active citizenship human, passive citizen human and ungoverned, savage human operates in complete interrelations. A state may claim that a group of people was normally constituted as active citizens with voting and other civic rights, yet the state may simultaneously be invested in pushing out these bodies into passive citizenship status, while also marking their bodies as savage, as ungoverned, by subjecting them to policies and structures that eradicate their claim to humanity and to civic belonging. Our Kantian framework allows us to see political contestations not only as a contest over resource distribution, but entangled with those as conflicts over a group's position on the continuum of citizenship. Needless to say, in a Kantian world, decisions about the distribution of governmental resources are connected to active citizenship. Only active citizens can determine autonomously who does and who does not profit from governmental action. Indeed, the sociologist Thea Scopel notes that very conservative Americans intensely, are intensely motivated by a sense that America is no longer their country. Fear of the other, the migrant, the black, the Hispanic, the gay, the lesbian, the queer, the transgendered person, intermingles with a rejection of those entitlement programs that do not benefit their own demographic. Federal handouts to undeserving poor are rejected, but Medicare and Social Security for older adults are embraced. For our discussion, I want to highlight, therefore, that we should take these concerns about who owns the government seriously and thus read evocations of religious freedom 
within the context of delimiting the contours, internal stratifications and external boundaries of the body politic, whose bodies and interests are marked as to matter for the state and as properly demanding state attention, and whose bodies are marked as alien outside of the state and thus demanding abjection by state power and proper citizenry. So this brings us then to the second topic, the Roberts Court's framework of religious liberty claims and the entanglement of causality. So to resituate our discussion, in the first part of this paper, I claimed that contestations over religious liberty in the United States are entangled with contestations over citizenship. Just now I introduced a fluid concept of citizenship as a continuum on a sliding scale from the status of active to passive to, the, to that of the ungoverned. Now let me turn to religious liberty jurisprudence and ask how do the innovations of the Roberts Court affect these contestations over citizenship? What contours of democracies do we see if we analyze the Roberts Court's decisions? The legal scholar Barry McDonnell recently reviewed the changes in religious liberty jurisprudence wrought by the Roberts Court. McDonnell diagnoses a substantial shift in how the Rehnquists and the Roberts Courts adjudicate requests that religionists should be granted exemptions from laws that incidentally burden their religious conduct. He sees Employment Division versus Smith as a watershed moment, signaling both Rehnquists' success in this area and the foundation of the eventual counter-movement. At stake in Smith was the question of whether the fact that the plaintiffs ingested peyote as part of religious practice exempted them from Oregon's drug laws. In Smith, the Rehnquist court established the doctrine that laws that incidentally burden religion do not, marry free exercise, do not merit free exercise scrutiny, thereby weakening the standards that at least theoretically had been placed since Sherbert versus Werner. Under the doctrine of the Sherbert regime, the state would have to show that the government pursues a compelling state interest through laws that incidentally restrict religious conduct. Additionally, in Yoder, the court held that such laws must be narrowly tailored and represent the least restrictive action necessary to pursue this governmental interest. Quote, only those interests of the highest order and those not otherwise served can overbalance legitimate claims to the free exercise of religion. Let me flag already here the question, what constitutes a legitimate claim? In contrast to this old regime, Rehnquist noted already in an earlier dissent, Whereas here a state has enacted a general statute, the purpose and effect of which is to adv advance the state's secular goals, the free exercise clause does not, in my view, require the state to conform that statute to the dictates of religious conscience of any group. This formulation presages the reasoning in Smith. Indeed, Anthony Scalia, writing for the majority in Smith, declared a new regime. Quote, the government's ability to enforce generally applicable prohibitions of socially harmful conduct, like its ability to carry out other aspects of public policy, cannot depend on measuring the effect of a governmental action on a religious objector's spiritual development. Any stricter reading would allow the religious objector to become, quote, a law unto himself, which contradicts both constitutional tradition and common sense. In terms of the Establishment Clause, Rehnquist, however, argued for a more relaxed reading, claiming that a correct interpretation of this clause prohibits federal support of religious activities if and only if they are aimed at promoting particular religious beliefs. Again, in his earlier dissent, he had argued that the legislature could voluntarily grant religious exemption to general laws in most cases without constitutional difficulty. In other words, while the Rehnquist court was reluctant to establish a strict scrutiny burden on unintentionally governmental restrictions on religious conduct, Rehnquist himself saw the possibility of accepting by statute religious conduct from general laws. And Congress took up this option by the 1993 Religious Freedom Restoration Act. 
that had the expressed purpose to, quote, restore the compelling interest test as set forth in Sherbert and of Yoder. And the court subsequently accepted Congress's reintroduction of the Sherbert-Yoder regime for federal law. Notably, 21 state legislatures have passed their own Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and 11 states incorporated similar claims into their constitutions. Thus, MacDonald justly claims that, despite the court's ruling in Smith, the Sherbert approach to religious exemption claims has been restored in the United States to a substantial degree, but mostly as a matter of legislative accommodation rather than constitutional right. If MacDonald is correct, then the question arises what theological political regime results? What is the status of religious liberty claims in the public sphere? And what vision of democracy is implied? These questions are particularly pressing given our prior analysis that religious liberty claims are indeed historically and inextricably connected to contestations over citizenship. To analyze the status of religious beliefs, let me now turn to the Roberts Court's most influ influential innovation in Hobby Lobby, namely the rule that religious burden exists if the claimant sincerely states that such a burden exists. In general, the Robert Courts continued the voluntary restriction by statute to the, of the Sherbert strict scrutiny regime. However, now based in statute, strict scrutiny turned out to be more fatal than when it was under Sherbert. Particularly in Hobby Lobby, the court further developed this regime with a somewhat novel emphasis on what constitutes a legitimate claim to religious exemption. Here, the majority noted that Congress expanded the notion of free exercise to cover not only First Amendment formulations, but also practices that are, quote, not compelled by or central to a system of religious beliefs. Consequently, the Robert Court established a rule that the court must defer to a particular claimant's sincere assertion of religious burden. The court obliges the government to grant most expensive credence to a person's claim that something is her sincerely held belief, as well that a particular action would constitute a substantial burden. A person, be it a natural person or a closely held business or an organization claiming a religious exemption, is not asked to prove that a particular governmental regulation reasonably can be seen as curtailing religious conduct, the assertion that it does suffices. This reasoning played itself out in subsequent cases following the Hobby Lobby decision. In Sharpie Holdings versus United States, Judge Robert Wilman, Wallman, writing for the Eighth Circuit, states that if petitioners succeed in showing that the law substantially burdens their religious conduct if, quote, they have a sincere belief that it does. Their affirmative answer to that question is not for us to dispute. In contrast, the Second Circuit held that whether the regulation objected to imposes a substantial burden is an altogether different inquiry from the question of whether a religious belief involved is sincere. However, let us recall how tenuous the causal chain was in Hobby Lobby that connected the actions of the business and the alleged curtailing of the business owner's religious conduct. Thus, the Eighth Circuit reading seems to be closer in line with the Supreme Court's reasoning. In other words, there is no examination of the putative causal chain that connects the protected religious practice with the practice mandated by law for which a petitioner seeks an exem exemption. This point is particularly intriguing in cases involving exemptions desired by Roman Catholic institutions for conduct involving abortion and contraception. Roman Catholic canon law, for example, has developed a fine-grained apparatus for appropriating criminal responsibility based on an analysis of where an act falls in the causal chain leading to an abortion. For example, an acceptable reading of canon law holds that the routine activities of administrators in hospitals performing abortions do not constitute the level of necessary cooperation leading to criminal punishment, in this case, excommunication. Indeed, one would be hard-pressed to 
establish a causal chain such that the act of triggering the opt-out mechanism for providing healthcare coverage that includes giving employees access to contraception leads with necessity to the use of contraception. A Roman Catholic institution, particularly one, one run by vowed religious, could respond that it holds itself, however, to a higher moral standard than that of avoiding excommunication. Thus, such an institution could claim that it considers itself morally implicated even if its actions are not strictly necessarily to bring about the morally abhorrent result. Here we are then squarely in the territory of what Smith aimed to avoid. A governmental action is measured by its effect on the religious objector's spiritual development. However, with Congress's Religious Freedom Restoration Act and Hobby Lobby, we are now in a post-Smith world. Thus, it seems warranted that the Eighth Circuit ruled that we should take at face value the objectors claim that their participation in the accommodation process makes them morally and spiritually complicit in an action they abhor. Hence, there is no need for discovery of fact as to whether the rejected contraceptive measures are in fact, as the petitioners claim, abortion inducing. Indeed, from a medical perspective, there's a strong evidence to counter that factual claim. However, as long as they are sincere, plaintiff seems entitled not only to their claim of burden, but also to whatever they claim to be the facts. In sum, the court seems reluctant to evaluate a person's claim to burden by assessing the reasonableness of her perception of a causal claim and her role in it. Now I want to talk about the causal entanglement. Um, and for this, we have a little bit of formal logic, just because. Um, <clears throat> this reluctance to make, make sense if we consider religious conduct as implicated and entangled in complex networks of practices. As I've argued in the Between a Man and a Woman book, a practice that is narrowly considered religious is stabilized, experienced as meaningful, and motivated by other connected ordinary practices. You draw a bubble bath for your husband when he comes home from work and thereby you submit to him and that reflects your belief in a wider political order which in turn reflects your belief about the divine power of God to which you have to submit which is mirrored in our political submission to laws, um, if you follow me. So it's, it's an entanglement of discourses that keeps religious claims in place and gives them meaning. If that entanglement is true, then we cannot separate so nicely secular from non-secular conduct. And we have seen indications of this entanglement in the first part of this paper when discussing the political religious interconnections of religious claims during the civil rights era. Consequently, when testing whether or not a particular conduct is part of the set of a religionist's sincere religious conduct, we cannot invoke a simple and strict opposition between religious and secular, say, economic or political goals. Secondly, when assessing religious burden, it seems less fortuitous to conceive of a causality as a single chain connecting a secular activity with a burdened religious conduct. Rather, the regulated activity is causally entangled with the protected conduct such that any change in one affects the other. This type of causal entanglement is not foreign to our ordinary concept of causality. For example, when we say, the music makes the party. Indeed, we can appeal to a similar, similar entanglement if one would want to argue that my ability to have intimate relations with my husband is entangled with my ability to love him. Thus we can map the logic of the Eighth Circuit in applying Hobby Lobby in the following manner. Let us call the protected conduct phying, P phys, if and only if, phying is part of P's sincere religious practices. Let us call the causally entangled practice in turn pying. So you see, Pieing, if and only if fieing's government regulation disables P's ability to pie, 
government regulation X disables peace ability to phi from premise one and two. Statutory protections make government interventions inadmissible if the unduly disables peace ability to phi. Therefore, statutory protections make government intervention X inadmissible, P3 and P4. According to Hobby Lobby, the claim that P1 and that P2 have to take to be taken at face value by the courts if petitioners sincerely assess them, assert them. This seems to make sense because what would it mean to evaluate these claims? Evaluating these claims would require first assessing the correct type of causal entanglement between so-called secular and religious conduct. Secondly, the justices would need to establish which level of causal engagement would violate the spiritual well-being of a given religionist. Are nuns allowed to have stricter standards than avoiding excommunication? <clears throat> Importantly, however, <clears throat> this hands-off approach to sincere religious claims destabilizes the ability to assess what is a sincere religious belief itself. By what standards do the courts determine if P1 or P2 are sincerely asserted? If they are disbarred from taking recourse to a strict secular religious distinction in motivations. In other words, we cannot first disallow a secular religious distinction in establishing causal entanglement and then evoke the very distinction in establishing religious sincerity. To point out that this problem is not purely theoretical, let me remind us how popular the gospel of prosperity movement is in this country. <clears throat> Thus, it would be not far-fetched to see a particularly allegedly secular economic profit motive as being, as being entangled with conduct that is more narrowly seen as religious conduct. And since corporations are persons with religious rights, you can see where that could lead us. Without access to a clear secular religious distinction in our motives of action, how do we assess the sincerity of religious belief or of a claim to religious burden? I take it that the answer has to be along the lines of the following standard. We know it when we see it. Religious sincerity is somehow self-authenticating to us. <clears throat> And this brings us to the last part, a reformed Calvinist polity. These three claims that a religionist should not be forced to divorce her secular from her religious motivations based in causal entanglement, that secular institutions should not evaluate religious claims by secular standard, and that religious beliefs are self-authenticating, are central tenets of reformed epistemology. In particular, the philosopher Nicholas Wolterstorff promulgated them in his conversations with Jürgen Habermas about the role of religion in a secular dem democracy. Habermas advocates a translation requirement for religious claims in the institutional public of secular democracies. This requirement demands that religiously motivated concerns need to be expressed in language that is accessible to all citizens, independent of their particular religious backgrounds. This translation allows all members of a polity to participate in public debate about the laws that should govern. To put this in our Kantian terms, the requirement defends our ability to serve as active citizens on equal discursive terms. The participation of active citizens in public discourse weaves the Habermasian policy together. By speaking together in terms that we all share, we become one polity, says Habermas who we are as members of a democracy and who we are as a republic is established through the process of discursive participation, which pressures the point of who is allowed to speak. However, Wolterstorff claims that this translation requirement is unduly burdensome for the religionist. She is forced to dissociate into public, secular and private religious reasons her motive in supporting a particular public policy. Yet, her secular citizen neighbors are not obligated to perform a similar splitting of motives. Thus, she too should be allowed to present her political views as they are without concerns for their origins. Here, Woltersdorf's political argument links with a Barthian, Barthian theological and epistemological claim, religious beliefs 
are not to be evaluated based on an epistemological foundation that is exterior to them. They are self-founding. Luther's alleged dictum at the Diet of Worms seems to be the gold standard of religious belief and sincerity. Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, God help me, amen. Consequently, a secular democracy has to withstand, says Walter Stoff, the presence of these reformed Christian beliefs that ought not and need not be communicated in non-reformed Christian terms. While it may be surprising, given the denominational makeup of the Roberts Court, our analysis of its religious exemption jurisprudence following the Religious Freedom Restoration Act demonstrate that it used closer to Walter Storff's reformed Christianity than to Habermas's Kantianism. To explore what this means for the underlying vision of democracy, let me return to the considering considerations opening this talk, the rhetorical nexus between religious objections, discrimination based on sexual orientation and on race. In many public policy and legislative proposals accommodating religious objectors to laws disbarring, disbarring discrimination based on sexual orientation, the underlying assumption seems to be that no sincere objection to racial discrimination could be mounted. The idea here seems to be that we know that any such claims to racial discrimination would have to be insincere. But as the opening section of this talk showed, in the recent history of the United States, sincerely held religious claims were marshaled to support racial discrimination. Indeed, the House version of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 included a clause allowing for religiously motivated exemptions from its equal employment provision. The act passed finally without any religious accommodation. Yet the legal landscape has changed. After the Rehnquist Court opened the door for statutory accommodation, and after Congress walked through it by passing the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, the question of how far-reaching religious exemptions should be migrated conceptually and factually to the legislatures. Indeed, we see a number of state assemblies considering religious exemption laws. Some of these are narrowly tailored to protect, for example, religious organizations from providing adoption services to couples in same-sex marriage. Others include protecting religiously motivated discrimination of gay or lesbian persons in the fields of employment, housing, and service. Thus, the adjudication of what we consider to be an acceptable, sincere religious belief, we know it when we see it, or burden, has migrated to the legislative process. In this framework, the legislatures can, if they so choose, provide for religious exemptions, if doing so protects persons or institutions that could consider their sincerely held beliefs burdened. Thus, a state legislature could decide to protect religionists who object to same-sex marriage, but not those religionists who object to interracial marriage. It's a voluntary exemption, not a required one. Indeed, the 2016 First Amendment Defense Act of Georgia states that, quote, Government shall not take any discriminatory action against a person wholly or partially on the basis of that such person believes, speaks, or acts in accordance with a sincerely held religious belief or moral conviction that marriage is or should be recognized as the union of one man and one woman, or that sexual relations are properly reserved to such a marriage. So if you are a motel owner and you decide I'm not going to rent out a room to an unmarried heterosexual couple because sexual relations are properly reserved to such a marriage, you should not be able to be um, discriminated against using the language of this act. Or if you don't rent um, the room to a gay couple because they may enact uh, gay sex and they are not married according to a definition of marriage, you should not be discriminated against. Absent any guidance from the courts about what constitutes a burden or a sincere claim, we witness the evolution of a statutory framework where state legislatures establish the kind of exemptions they see as warranted. In effect, this means that what constitutes a viable claim to religious exemption is based on the rule of majority. Importantly, religious claims to sincere beliefs and to burden appear to be self-authenticating. 
there's no process to evaluate the claims to a sincere belief or the claim to being burdened in one's conduct. Claims to religious burden are beyond the scope of public interrogation. Religious belief is intensely privatized. At the same time, states like Georgia can implement by majority rule religious exemptions that fit the religious political sentiment of their constituents. Given the lack of public discourse about the rationality of such claims to burden, such legislation, however, will seem to be either self-evident or idiosyncratic. In this Waltersdorfian polity, then, religion becomes the occasion of the assertion of the private, together with the assertion of majoritarian publicly shared sentiment or animus. What is missing, to say this in Habermasian terms, is the power of discourse to weave a public together. Disputes over citizenship and belonging to a shared politic turn, if they are mediated through the idiom of religion, to stopped conversations, and the democratic process unmasks itself as a proxy for a war of all against all. Thank you very much. So there are two slippery slopes, right? One slippery slope is if we allow these kinds of exemptions for same-sex, um, for, for sexual orientation claims, uh, why not allow them for interracial marriage claim? Or why not allow them for uh, s s sex discrimination claims, right? So if your sincerely held religious belief is that a woman should not work, why should you offer employment to women? Uh, so that's one slippery slope. And the other slippery slope is that if we don't allow, I don't quite understand, can you? I think the example that I was thinking of was like for the, the cake situations where the cake owner, or the person who owns the cake store owners, they had a fundamental religious belief that they were participating in a marriage thing or ceremony and so then they, they decided they couldn't be a part of that. Um, and in talking about that case, uh, I've heard frequent rhetoric of, well, this is just the start. Next is going to be putting pastors in prison for mm. you know, not doing what they can so this is a beautiful example for causal entanglement, right? So n now after Hobby Lobby, we cannot dispute the claim that providing a cake means to necessarily um, enable gay, a, a gay marriage, which you abhor. So, uh, so we, we can't say anything after ho Hobby Lobby, right? Uh, uh, the place where this then goes is the legislatures, right? So if then you let, because it's the solution by statute, if, the, if your legislature gives you some form of protection um, to opt out of the requirement to serve the public, th then because of ca causal entanglement, um, then you're golden um, as the bakery owner. Uh, by the way, um, I had that experience um, when me and my husband and I tried to order a cake and we were, um, yeah, so we exactly had that experience. Um, we, we, prior to Hobby Lobby, one could say, well, the First Amendment right of a organization to order its a religious organization to order its own uh, affairs uh, makes it very unlikely that uh, we would you know, cart off the pastors to prison. But again, for example, New York State. Uh, 
protected that explicitly in their uh, gay marriage legislation. So again, the solution by statute. So I think, uh, I think the slippery slope argument, um, there are two slippery slopes, right? So one is if we grant this objection here, why not grant it there? And the other slippery slope is uh, carting off pastors to prison um, or bakers to prison. Um, in the novel regime of causal entanglement, um, it goes to the legislatures. But what that then does is, uh, is, since we have to take these assertions of burden at face value, even the legislature cannot really reasonably argue about that. So it then becomes actually a decision by fiat. Right? That's what the majority wants. So we will have a patchwork of different territories with different exemptions uh, reflecting the religious political sentiment slash animus of the locality, which is, if you studied modern theory of religion, exactly the modern concept of religion, right? Religion is intensely private. It's my inner feeling. Um, even Buddhists need to meditate, even though that's you know, a modernization. And religion is territorial, right? So here is the continent that's all green, and we are all blue, and th those are all yellow. Um, so it, I, I, what I see in, in um, this framework is a reinscribing of this modern ideology slash discourse of religion, which leads to a polity that cannot talk to each other, right? So, so let me go, yes. So, the confluence of the um, decision to give personhood to corporations and the Hobby Lobby decision basically allows for all sorts of rolling back of, of, the, of the, I guess, the public sphere, is what you're saying. Um, if I'm a personal corporation and I have these religious rights now as a corporation, I can deny all sorts of if your legislature gives you that kind of exemption. Um, so that's that, uh, the Rehnquist court's this decision to open this ability, the door, to create exemptions by statute to which Congress walked and you know, 11 state legislature walked. Um, together with Hobby Lobby means you have to have a legislature that opens that door for you. But there's, yeah, so, so here, there, then. Um, so I was thinking about the Hobby Lobby decision um, and Steve Green's talk um, from the perspective of the folks that wrote uh, RIFRA, um, I think they had a certain intention, and it wasn't the outcome of the Hobby Lobby case, because they wrote it from the perspective of individuals, and it got applied to a corporation as an individual. Um, and so I was just thinking about, you talked about like that entanglement, um, and my husband and I are business owners, and one thing we realized is, as business owners, we don't ever want to be liable or accountable on a corporate level as having a religious belief. There's kind of a slippery slope we haven't talked about mm. when, um, I mean, I think about the ramifications. If we're going to view Hobby Lobby as an individual with the right to religious beliefs, that means they can be held accountable on that level. Mm -hmm. And part of why you have a corporation is to kind of have some umbrella protections from you personally. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, um, we have a Volkswagen dealership, and if something happens with Volkswagen, we can have some safeguards because we're individually not our mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a piece to it that's really interesting to explore in that we've kind of humanized the business or given it these rights, but the backlash of that could be, and I'm really interested to see like what kind of cases come up in the next several years um, when somebody says, okay, now I want to hold you accountable in the way that I would hold an individual liable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's definitely a fascinating uh, option. Um, I, I know that uh, Professor Green uh, highlighted the, oh my God, 
corporations on our person's side. I want to highlight the causal entanglement side, right? A burden is if the person, if the person corporation claims there is a burden and want to say why that actually makes sense. But if one goes down that road, we end in this um, rolling back of the public sphere if we are Habermasians or uh, agonistic vision of the public sphere, which then allows uh, for people with more economic options to the word that came to mind was trumpet their beliefs. I don't know why that came to mind. Uh, but, um, and I'm German. Um, so so it, it creates a change of the public sphere. Um, and that's what I want to highlight. Yeah. Yes? So the, the, I thank you for the talk. I, I enjoyed it a lot. And my question is about the religion and public sphere. And I wonder whether this you offer a kind of a false false dichotomy, or I want to believe it's a false dichotomy, mm -hmm. because that I really don't like either of these options. <laughs> either of these, one option is that the religious self authenticating kind of claims of sincerely has beliefs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, that's one extreme, and I'm not comfortable with that. And the other extreme is that the Habermas must demand for the public reason, yes. for the translation of the religious ideas into public sphere in a particular secular language mm -hmm. uh, that I'm also uncomfortable with that because I can easily see that a, a sort of good Samaritan and helping the foreigners is much more accessible to help the foreigner as opposed to counting cosmopolitan ethical justifications mm -hmm. which may be very very kind of difficult for maybe for many kind of people. Mm -hmm. So then my question is are there other ways to bring religion into public sphere in a meaningful conversation yeah. that doesn't allow us to fall either obeying or accepting self-authentication of religious that have beliefs, but on the other hand, doesn't necessarily require everyone to steep into Kantian discourse only then allow them into public sphere. I, I share your frustration. Uh, and uh, you said, I want to believe there's an alternative, and after Hobby Lobby, we are free to believe whatever we want, so. <laughs> uh, I want to believe that too, uh, but I think what we are dealing here are, uh, is the configuration of modern religion, right? So the discourse of modern religion seems to be uh, in depth constituted as either this intensely privatized self-authenticating Protestant thing, or as something that needs to be moved into something ethical and something which it's not, right? So part of, um, of, of the configuration of modern religion is, is that you have to show that your religion is some, somehow really ethical, super ethical, um, uh, translatable into Kant, and even better than that. So I, I think that uncomfortable option is the option that is pushed on us through the inheritance of the whole framework of modern religion. Um, you know, so I present as a uh, homosexual. Um, you know, so that's pushed on me as an identity through the framework of modern sexuality. Whether I feel comfortable, you know, and there are days where I don't feel comfortable. <laughs> Um, so I, I think your, your discomfort is pointing to a larger issue of what do we do with this modern concept of religion and how can we unhinge it. But now that it is uh, 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 it, it, an effective reality, a reality that creates reality um, uh, in our court system, in our international uh, court system, uh, it's very How do we dislodge it? Right? So. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to ask something very similar to what oh. Ron just asked. It just seems to me on the one hand you've got uh, a fragmentation of society, you know, where people are just radically individuated in their religious beliefs and there's no appeal to tradition at all. Or you've got fragmentation of the self on the other side where you're asked to have a religious identity that's opposed sometimes to the public secular identity. And I, I was 
could ask the same question. What, what kind of solution might you see to that? Uh, it seems to me that if we were to say, oh, you have to show, you have to be able to make recourse to your religious tradition, then you would disqualify uh, exemptions for people who wanted to not participate in or acknowledge interracial marriage. Because on the one, I mean, two things there. On the one hand, no one denied that an interracial couple was married mm -hmm. uh, in the civil rights era. The claim was that their marriage was uh, defective in some other way. Right? Well, but some, some. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, there were laws banning it. Banning they were. You could ban it, but if you were married in one state and moved to a state that had anti-miscegenation laws, the idea was that now you were a married couple and that was illegal. Right. Right? But it seems like what's at the heart of the or what was at the heart of the same-sex marriage debate was whether a same-sex union counts as a marriage mm. for natural law reasons, right? I don't know that evangelicals use natural law. Yeah, but this is, this is part of the problem, right? Right. Yeah. So, number one, I don't, I don't really think that pointing to tradition is helpful because, as you said, what counts as tradition becomes very difficult, right? So in the, there is the RIFRA, but then there's also another one um, uh, legislating, um, for example, inmates, and one uh, inmate claimed that his reading of Islam requires him to have a beard of a certain length, um, and then there was a debate whether or not that was actually part of um, a standard, re the traditional reading of Islam, and the justice has said that that's, that's inconsequential, right? So, but if you can't appeal to tradition or orthodoxy, what's whose orthodoxy? Yeah. So I mean that brings us back. So that, you know, it seems like then you're just stuck with the problem of. That's, that's why I called this a reformed Calvinist Walter Storfer in polity. <laughs> yeah. I know it when I see it. Well, I don't know. Uh, sorry. The, the yes, I, I was um, thinking about the fact that all of the examples seem to have to do with uh, refusal to obey civil law. And it, I, I'm wondering what you think about whether the courts would um, use a similar kind of accept a similar kind of reasoning if someone violated criminal law because certain things that are now crimes um, used not to be like marital rape or beating one's wife. Mm. Right? Um, and the justification for, for those acts being legal is uh, religious in nature. And so if someone could still hold such a religious view and say, well, I believe that God wants me to eat my children. Would, would the courts ever grant a religious exception for that? And it's a kind of a two-part question. If not, I suspect they wouldn't. Um, doesn't that show that there's something wrong with the arguments about the civil law? Well, the beauty of the uh, solution breaks, which brings us into this conundrum is uh, the statutory route. Right, so the, the courts put this straight into the legislature. So if you find the legislature that uh, would pass that law, presumably we would have then um, contestations of that and then we can see how the courts rule. Uh, it's currently very unlikely. But the unlikely, so, so as a philosopher I'm not happy with the unlikelihood, right? So what I think, uh, what this means is that the legislatures are free to provide voluntary exemptions for those whom they feel think like themselves or those who they need, right? Um, it seems very ad hoc. I mean, it doesn't seem as if there's a principle to reason. Yes. This group gets an exemption. Yes, yes. Group, it's a voluntary exemption. Or you get an exemption for this reason, but not for this reason. It's a voluntary, I mean, that, that is the language of voluntary exemption, right? So they can do it if they want. Mm -hmm. and, well, it, the, and the courts, I think, would be uh, reluctant to step in to tell the legislatures what they should want in legislating. Yeah.
Yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking, like, when do you sort of decide that sort of a legal process and a structure and sort of way of, of, of conveying meaning is it, just not capable of supporting our sort of new understandings of subjectivity? When do you just say we need new sort of alternative structure? And you, or, well, if, if I feel the same uh, frustration um, as you feel, then I think it's, I mean, I, I hope you feel this frustration <laughs> and you feel pinched between two horns of a dilemma. Uh, and I think that should make you feel, well, our, our political legal framework in adjudicating and thinking about religion is severely flawed. And that's why we all need to take your course. Right? No, no, it's, 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 seriously, that's why we need to think critically about uh, the, the, the deep framework that we have inherited and that we remobilized by having, for example, religious studies departments that do not talk to politics departments um, you know, and, and that are organized by traditions because we know what each tradition really is, which we don't. Um, so I think in a moment, in, in a, in a moment like this, we, we realize the need for new conceptual frameworks. And in the study of religion, there is, is now a decade old reflection on this new uh, conceptual framework, need for new conceptual frameworks, particularly also uh, you know, uh, by looking at the colonial or origins of the whole concept of religion and of tradition. Um, so I would, I would Go for, so the concept of the ungoverned that I used, I, I um, adopted from Partha Chatterjee's um, The Nations and the, the Fragments and the Politics of the Ungoverned. Um, so I think there would be places, places of ambiguity, queer, queer places. I think the, the solution here is to queer our understanding of religion and of citizenship and of, of um, sexualities. Um, and th there, are, there is a lot of work on queer citizenship. There is a lot of work on queer religion, but there is not a lot of work of, that intersects these two. Um. Yeah, I was just going to ask you if you could say a little bit more about why you think that that political process, when a state legislature passes a statute, why that isn't, doesn't sort of satisfy the requirement for a public conversation, and why, why you think it's dysfunctional. Because um, I think, I mean, in some of the places where it's happened, and I think it was South Dakota, I haven't followed this stuff very mm. closely, but it seemed like there was sort of like positions taken, but then, you know, those communities needed to be places where college students would relocate to work. And because of that, you know, there was sort of a backlash against the, right. against the, the legislation. And so, I, I don't know, I guess I just wonder if you followed those and whether they really are as dire as you <laughs> Yes, I want them to be. <laughs> uh, uh, are they self-authenticatingly dire? Um, I think what 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 happens in these debates is the assertion of burden, and then the assertion of economic loss. But what is missing? I want to tell me. I want to, the baker. Sorry, the, our colleague just left. I want the baker to tell me. Okay, if I'm, why is it rational for me to believe that selling this cake to this gay couple m makes me complicit in this apparent act? You know, I want to hear a little more about that, right? Um, and that does not happen. Sure. But I, I just mean at that higher level, when the legislature is considering whether to grant an exemption to people like the baker, does, does that conversation... Do you find that conversation no. satisfying, or do you think it's so majoritarian and so one-sided well, well, that, that con can't be irrational? That conversation doesn't happen, right? The conversation only happens, uh, th these people are burdened. And it's bad, so the b assertion of belief happens, and assertion of burden happens, but I don't see you know, a, a communication that would explain why the burden is, uh, the way it is. So, um, yes? So, thank you for that. That was a fascinating talk. Uh, I'm worried about this uh, reformist Calvinist polity. Does it, it in the sense that it seems to inevitably lead us to some sort of individual states ending up being some sort of Schmittian 
Mm -hmm. legislative body and is that, is that in your view is that inevitable from from this we're, we're going to have this inevitable uh, friend enemy relation in every every state because that seems the, the logic of, of of this move here yeah and that's Horrifying. Yeah, that that is that that is my that is my fear, right? My fear is that we end up, and and, and that's why I mentioned to you, right? This is this the individualization, and then at the same time the territorialization, right? Uh, and and lack of lack of responsiveness. So, so, so we're just, this Supreme Court decision seems like what you're saying has. The consequence that we end up in parliamentary crisis. Yeah. And, and, okay. and, and you know, it would. I mean, before I slit my wrists, uh, <laughs> it it would fit with an analysis, and I can dig up the source for that. That currently the United States is not really a majoritarian democracy, but is more. Of, an authoritarian oligarchy. So that would be the political theology fitting that. Um, because the judges and the congressional actors and the you know, august law professors writing the laws, they don't intend these things, but they are part of a mechanism, both an intellectual but also a, a mechanism of political economics that Makes certain possibilities front and center in our minds. Is there, is there any way of resisting this movement or that, that you can? Yeah. So I, I'm just wondering. I mean, so I, I, I totally, I agree. I think there needs to be a discourse shift, right? And I'm, and I heard you talking about really the way that. The discourse works now is largely set up by I think very much Robert's board. Mm. I'm wondering if it, you know a lot of the reason we don't have these legislators, these legislatures engaging in discourse about racial exclusion, right? They, you know, religious religious exemptions for racial exclusion is because the Supreme Court handed us the nice package of strict scrutiny mm -hmm. around racial discrimination. So it, it makes it easier for us to have that discourse, right, on the state level. Mm -hmm. So surely, <laughs> surely a discourse shift from Kennedy or from the, Supreme, the current Supreme Court around the way in which we classify sexual orientation, which they neglected to do in Obergefell, mm -hmm. um, is, is the way to kind of get around this state level um, discourse problem, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so that would be a political process, right, trying to get some form of strict scrutiny protection for, uh, well, not even sexual orientation, let's start with sex discrimination, right, right? that would be <laughs> a start which doesn't exist. But that would also require legislative action somehow, um, or political action that I don't see forth coming. Um, so I see this as, as a watershed in the sense that it enables the Schmittian polity um, and there are other forces pushing that Schmittian polity. So uh, yes, holding out hope for a constitutional amendment for uh, women's rights and maybe LGBT rights is valiant. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I think we really need a, re, but a rethinking of the terms of the political and of the religious and of the sexual together with heft behind it. Um, and I don't know how to do it, right? So that, I mean, that, that's, <laughs> I'm good at pointing out problems. I'm a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. We have time for one more. Yeah. Yes. So we have not solved this problem here. Oh, you think I speak with a foreign accent. <laughs> so therefore, in Europe, it's better. Um, it ain't. So, 
So my current book project is on um, the use of religious and sexual normativities in creation of uh, state legitimate state power, and I use France and Germany as examples. And the Schmidt, I mean, we got it from the Germans, right, Karl Schmidt. Um, uh, we find similar movements on different topics. So Americans get bent out of shape if they see two men, and it's, it's very gendered, uh, on a married, on a wedding cake. Uh, Germans get out, bent out of shape if uh, this Turkish woman is not their cleaning lady anymore, but now is their teacher and wears a veil. And... Uh, So the, the fragmentation of the polity and the openness for uh, political decision by fiat or by exception is working itself out in the German context differently in the US than in the US context. But I don't see the German context to be immune, even though they all would endorse a Habermasian uh, vision of liberal democracy. So by the way, the two illiberal purposes, one illiberal purpose was pushing people into passive citizenship and the other liberal purpose was the, the Schmittian, uh, Walter Storfian democracy. So are we ready to slit our wrists? No. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.